So the reason I'm doing this video today is because I got mentioned in a video yesterday on a watch Wes work. So Wes was doing a set of drum brakes on a GM truck and he mentioned, you know, Uncle Tony and his affinity for waxing nostalgic for drum brakes. And yeah, I do love drum brakes. And yes, he had a hard time. He was struggling through putting the brakes together. As most people who aren't familiar with these things do. Uh, but there are a couple of tricks and shortcuts I can show you to make like servicing these things that much easier, that much faster. And because there are so many different variations to it, I'm going to use this Chrysler setup here. The General Motors is very similar. Ford is a little, little but, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But it's off the car just for quick demonstration purposes. And I'm not going to bother with the self-adjusters or parking brakes. So this is just this stuff here. But I'll... I'll fill you in as we go along. So, uh, first, Wes, it's not that I'm nostalgic about drum brakes. It's just in certain applications, they work better. Like, for instance, on an older muscle car. Uh, let's say you're doing a restoration or, or uh, you know, you're just working with a classic muscle car from the 60s or the 70s. Factory disc brakes are significantly heavier than the factory drum brakes. And those factory disc brakes have a lot of parasitic drag they also don't release instantly. So if you're looking for you know, off-the-line performance, like drag strip type performance from an older muscle car, factory type muscle car, drum brakes have an advantage. And also in like foot brake type of racing, drum brakes will hold the car on the starting line where discs won't. And that's the reason why a lot of guys have to go to, to trans brakes. And also if you're doing something where you've got to build boost on the starting line, the drum brakes will hold the car on the line while the boost comes up better than disc brakes will. And also, for the average person driving the average way, the biggest advantage disc brakes have over drums is that they don't fade after several, let's say, high-speed stops. So unless you're driving your car, you're running up to like 100 miles an hour and it's slowing it down to 20 and I run it back to 100 and slow it down to 20, there is no advantage. I can't tell you how many people I've seen over the years make a disc brake conversion on their cars and then complain that it doesn't stop as good as it did with the drums and they can't figure out why. Aside from the, the fact that they're reducing the, uh, the amount of surface area of, the, of the, you know, the friction surface. And also it takes more pressure to operate the disc brakes. And then you've got the aftermarket conversions. And I have yet to see an aftermarket conversion that stands the test of time. There's always a glitch or a, a gotcha. And so, but anyway, let, let's not even get into that. So there are certain aspects of assembling drum brakes that are fairly universal and what most people will do is like what you were doing what Wes was doing and that's trying to assemble it one shoe at a time but these things aren't designed to be serviced that way they're designed to be partially assembled off the vehicle so you got your shoes right? and there'll always be a spring okay that goes across the bottom because that's where your star wheel is your self adjuster right so what you do is, instead of trying to assemble it on the car, you put your spring in the shoes, and then you drop your self-adjuster in, and you get an assembly like that. Okay, now on Fords, and only Fords, it's a little tricky because they attach this bottom spring to this self-adjuster. It's like a triangulated piece. So it's a little, you can put it together like this, but then it's a little wonky handling it. You just have to, you have to handle it slowly. So now obviously there's no axle or hub on this, you know, for demonstration purposes. So if you wanted to put this on, you would just spread them, right? Bring them over the hub, the axle, or, or whatever it is that you're dealing with there, okay? And put them in place. Now also I noticed that you were trying to fish in the, the uh, parking brake spreader. So on these things, here's one right here, on these, you actually put this in before. You just put this in and you rest it on top of the axle or whatever it is that's sticking out there. So once you've got them on there like that, let's put this thing back on there. Very important piece. Once you've got, there, got them on there like that, Stick your anchor pin through, 
turn the flat spot straight up and down so it's going straight up and down. Hang your spring. I use just a simple pair of pliers. A lot of guys like to use the, uh, there's a special, you know, the, the thing. I think I've got a couple of them, but I've, I've never used them. So you just take a regular pair of pliers like this, line up your slot so it's straight up and down, push it on, quarter turn, you're done. And let's get the other side too. You know what, before, before I even go any further, I should, I should mention this. There are several places where the shoe contacts the backing plate. So here's one, is these flat spots. Here's one here, here's one here, here's one here. White lube. You gotta give these a little dab of white lube. And that'll keep these things from, from squeaking as they're going through their operation. Okay, so let's put this thing back. Oh, and also on your, on your star wheel and your self-adjuster, the part that comes out, white lube inside there. And that'll keep it nice and happy. All right. Did you know that Chrysler high performance cars with 11 inch drum brakes didn't have any self adjuster? They actually used a spring that came down and kept the star wheel from spinning on its own. And you would have to adjust them manually. So like if you've got like a 68, 69, like you know, 70 Roadrunner, any of those cars, they don't have self adjusters. You just have to get in there and actually manually adjust them. So if this was on the vehicle, this would be the back. And the large, the bigger shoe always goes to the back, the smaller shoe always goes to the front. So if this was a General Motors car, at this point, you would put the self-adjuster arm on here. But this one is a Chrysler. So in this case, you've got this cable. You just hang the cable over the top like that. You put your first spring on. Just grab a screwdriver. Okay, a lot of you guys use that tool. There's like a like a big weird plier type of thing. I can't even, I've, I've seen them for the last 45 years. I still don't know how to use one. Just use a big screwdriver, pop them over. And like I said, because this is a Chrysler, you've got this flange that the cable rides on. So that gets attached to this spring. You pop the spring in there. And that's it. Pull this over, tuck it up there, and if the self-adjuster was on here, you would just lift it up and slide it over that. And it's that easy. That's it, right? It should take you, I'm going to say on average, takes me about uh, less than five minutes to do an R&R. If you're not, you know, obviously, if you're not replacing all kinds of stuff, but if it's just a quick R&R, &R, just going to change the, the shoes, it takes about five minutes total. So that's it. Quick and easy. Drum break, R&R. &R. I hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.